Right, good afternoon. We'll resume then. Mr. Berto, we were in the middle of testifying. Go ahead. She's muted. Can't hear you. My apologies. Your Honor, I would like to request permission at this point to pause my testimony in order to call my therapist since he has another appointment at 2 p.m. All right. Sounds reasonable. What's the therapist's name? His name is Joe Clems. I will tell him to log in now. He replied okay, so he'll be logging in momentarily. Are you Joe Flynn? I am. Your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that any testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you? I swear. State your name in full, then spell your last name for the court record. Joseph Clems, K-L-E-M-Z as in zebra. Go ahead with the question. Uh, Joe, can you tell me what your professional title is? Yes, it's a licensed independent clinical social worker. I'm the founder and CEO of Real Life Counseling. And what is the nature of your relationship with me? I am your primary mental health therapist. What educational background do you have in the field of therapy? Definitely. I have my bachelor's in social work from Eastern Washington University. I have my master's in social work from Eastern Washington University. And then I'm a mental health specialist in the state of Washington. In addition, I'm a licensed clinical social worker in the state of Washington. I am also a certified EMDR therapist nationally. Can you tell me what is EMDR? EMDR is eye movement and desensitization and response. It's the full title, but it is a trauma is a it's a specialty intervention for trauma. Can you also tell the court what other specialties you have with respect to trauma? Yes, I have a trauma certificate from the Trauma Justice Institute, which is by Bezel Vanderkluk, back east. When did I start seeing you as a client? I am looking at my notes for the exact date. It is August 2nd, 2019. As a mandatory reporter, have you ever had to report anything I have said during our sessions? No. What diagnosis have you been able to provide with me? The, the technical listing would be F43.12. What that means is it's post-traumatic stress disorder. It is chronic. So in addition to that, it's a clinical diagnosis that I've also given as complex PTSD. And in your experience as a trauma specialist, do you find that a patient can have PTSD and trauma issues with adults but not with children? Can you clarify that one? If I have trauma issues and have been diagnosed as such, would you say that those issues are specific to adult relationships and relationships with other adults? Um, well, they can be. They, they can't impact relationships with your with children, or they can impact relationships with with adults. In your case, I see it as interacting with adults. Thank you. Thank you. Who are some of the people that you've heard me discuss in therapy as contributors to my PTSD? Yeah. This would be um, a, a couple different people. We've talked about uh, your history with your brother. Uh, we've talked about your history with your mother um, and your history with your um, ex-wife. 
So the history with my brother, is that Gabriel? Correct. And my ex-wife, is that Caitlin? Yes. Speaking of me as a client, how would you assess my willingness to make progress with you in working through my trauma issues? You've been very willing. And so you have completed all the tasks that I've given you. And I, I, I give a lot of homework and you've watched those videos. You have read the material that I've given you and you have actively worked on the material that we've discussed in session. Have you uh, seen progress with respect to my movement through trauma since working with me? I have. You've done, a, I think, an excellent job in being able to connect your current behavior to historical trauma wounds. Um, that awareness is coming online. It, you know, we still have some work to do in terms of being able to regulate present mood and behavior, but we've seen you do a really good job of making that connection, which is pivotal, pivotal in trauma work. Based on what you said about my trauma being associated with adult relationships, do you think that without adult relationships present, i.e. if I'm just with my children, my trauma presentation is minimal, if at all? I, I Objection would... leading. What are, as your, what are your, some of your, um, the strengths that you have witnessed with me as your client firsthand? Uh, the big one is, I think, your willingness to learn, right? So your willingness to learn about how your trauma history impacts your present, how it's impacted uh, adult, specifically romantic relationships throughout your history. Um, and you just have a passion of wanting to know about that. One of the biggest strengths that I've seen was when I first accepted you as a client and you were looking for a therapist that specialized in dual diagnosis. So one with individuals on the spectrum and one with individuals with complex PTSD. I was clear from the, the beginning that I did not understand autism or any spectrum issue, but you were good about saying, you know what, I'd be willing to, you'd be willing to teach me in those areas. Um, there's this, sadly, in our Clark County, there is no therapist that's going to have that specialty with adults. And so we were able to collaborate on that issue. And I saw that as amazing strength and flexibility. Is it your knowledge that I was seeing an autism specialist therapist prior to shifting to you? Uh, my, my, excuse me, sorry. Uh, my knowledge was that you had interacted with several therapists and one of them was a specialist. And specific to working with you, my goal was to continue releasing trauma. Is that correct? Correct. Um, what would you say is my prognosis going forward? Uh, prognosis is excellent. You know, I, we, we still have some work to do. We are still working on our treatment plan. We still have some objectives to complete. But with your continued engagement and your passion to learn, um, I see no reason why we should not see a reductions of symptoms related to PTSD. Are you familiar with the uh, incident in October 2019 regarding a, a situation with myself and my spouse? Yes. And I saw you continuously from then till now, is that correct? That's correct. What did you see as, as my stability level given I had gone through such a stressful incident with my spouse? You know, as a therapist, I definitely saw that, you know, your mood was definitely deregulated. It means you were, you were struggling to cope with stress. But at the same time, I saw you as someone who was taking care of, you know, you needed a housing situation. You needed a safe place for your kids. You needed to be able to have activities for your kids to do at this house. And so I saw you taking care of all these things, even though you and I were working on managing your mood. I mean, this, this was devastating for you to not have your kids. And, but at the same time, you were taking care of all the things you needed to do to be a parent. Since close to seven months have passed since that incident, have you noticed that my mood regulation has drastically improved? It has, definitely. You know, we, we're, we're always going to see hiccups, but I've seen a constant improvement. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Cross-examination. Thank you. Mr. Clems, do you go by doctor or 
Do you have a doctoral degree? I can't remember. I do not have a doctoral degree. Okay. I can just go by Joe. Okay. Thank you. Did, were there any other diagnoses that you might have found with regards to the petitioner? No. Have you ever discussed with her her anger issues? Yes. And what kind of work are you doing on managing those anger issues? So when I talk about being able to regulate mood, um, that, that is what we're, what we're doing, right? So an anger outburst related to anxiety or related to protection. So we're, we're constantly working on grounding and regulating mood. Has she expressed to you that she has had outbursts towards the children? No. Has she, have you guys discussed domestic violence? Yes. And to what extent have you discussed domestic violence? Uh, around the, the recent uh, matter with uh, her current relationship. And did she discuss with you the violent acts and actions that she took against her spouse? Objection. Uh, I object to this line of questioning specific to the fact that Sarah isn't even allowed to testify on this matter. And Joe, conversations about that with Joe, being that they relate to Sarah, are still privileged. Well, the privilege extends to people not calling your spouse as a witness. There's no indication that he talked to the spouse. And if he had talked to her, it obviously wouldn't be a privileged communication since he's a third party. So your objections overruled, I'll indicate you cannot have it both ways. You cannot talk about the parts of the relation of the incident and the parts of the relationship that you want to talk about and then constantly bar the other side from bringing up what they want to talk about. So you've asked, yes, him, you've asked him about your, your um, coming to see him after this incident, and so they're entitled to explore it. Your objections overruled. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Joe, did you ever read the um, police report with regard to that incident? No. Are you familiar with the, the fact that it is alleged from that that there was a physical assault by the petitioner against her wife, Sarah? Um. My client and I have talked about the conflicts that uh, there was an alleged assault, and my understanding that uh, the charges are no more. Right, but did, when you talked about it around the time that it happened, did your client admit that she actually struck her wife? I'm trying to... Uh, it's not in my notes. I'm sorry, now all of a sudden I'm getting a lot of feedback. Somebody must have something on that they didn't have before. So what was the answer to the question? Oh, can you repeat the question? Did she admit to you that she had assaulted her wife? Not to my knowledge. Have you discussed the fact that she believes that she's a wolf? that she identifies with characteristics of a wolf, but we have never, never talked about that she is a wolf. And what has she said about identifying with characteristics of a wolf? So we've talked a lot about how, in terms of characteristics of a pack, and so having a group of people that support her, so that is her support system and how she identifies with that support system. We've talked about the intricacies of relationships within a PAC system. Uh, we've talked about the, int the intricacies and the ability to be able to defend oneself and to be able to provide for oneself. And so that's and all. Isn't it true that in a, in a wolf pack situation, there's always an alpha? Yes. And does she consider herself the alpha of her pack? She certainly wants to be, right? But also, what do you think that means to her? Um, I think that she wants to lead. She, whether she wants to lead in the workplace, she wants to um, lead in relationships, right? She wants to be a leader. Do you see that as problematic when it comes to co-parenting? 
as long as one is willing to be flexible and collaborate. And do you see much flexibility on the part of your of your patient? Based on client reports, yes, I see someone based. willing to be flexible. So it's based solely on client reports. You haven't actually observed her and how she actually interacts with other people. That's correct. Yeah, I haven't been in the workplace with her or in her in her living room with her relationships. But in my office, I do see someone who's very much willing to collaborate and be flexible. And has she discussed her belief in past lives with you? Hmm. We did briefly in the beginning of our sessions. It hasn't been a focus of our area, no. And who is it that she believes to, who, to have been in her past lives? Uh, we, we haven't discussed that. Would it concern you if she had beliefs that she was Jesus Christ and Buddha in her past lives? Would that be something that would cause you some concern? I think if someone believed that they were Jesus Christ in the present, I would consider that delusional. Um, if somebody thought that they might have been Jesus in a past life, I would, as long as there wasn't delusional behavior, I'm not going to counter someone's spiritual beliefs. Well, what if this individual believes that now her son is Jesus reincarnated? Again, I'd be very hard-pressed to counter someone's spiritual beliefs. It really comes down to, is it spiritual or is it delusional? And I have not detected delusional behavior in my sessions, nor my assessments. One second, Your Honor. Were you treating her during the month of December 2019? If you want, I can pull up my record and get specific dates, if that would be helpful. I don't need specifics, just were you treating her during the month of December of 2019? Yes. Okay. Are you familiar with some ritual that she um, participated in on Christmas Eve? Uh, we had talked about it, yes. Can you please describe for the court what that ritual was? I'm... I don't have complete notes. I'm just looking up at it real quick. Give me one second. I do not have notes on the ritual, no. Do you have any recollection whatsoever about it? We had talked about it briefly. My recollection is that it was like she was doing some kind of cleanse. So are you familiar with the fact that she wrote an email to quite a few people about this ritual and that she could potentially die? She told me that, definitely. I believe it was right around the, the time of her birthday. Is this correct? Yes. Yep. And, and so you have no idea how she could have died in this ritual? When we talked about it, she had told me very specifically that she had drank a little too much around her birthday, and she was being a little bit over the top in those emails. Um, when she talked about the ritual, it was very briefly with me, and it was nothing life-threatening that I, I mean, it didn't even make my, my notes in terms of danger of self, because well, I didn't assess it that way. So that is your understanding that, you know, this whole thing became about because she was intoxicated. Correct. Okay. And you've, you indicated in your testimony that you don't have experience with autism or a broad understanding of autism, correct? Correct. Um, with, she, when she discusses trauma with regard to Kate, what is the trauma that was caused to her from Kate? Uh, bear with me on this one. And so this would actually, the original trauma wounds would be around neglect and, abad and abandonment um, and emotional manipulation when she was a child, right? And so that became the trauma wound that then reoccurs within most romantic relationships. And so um, pretty much every, we've traced most romantic relationships with her to have reoccurring themes. And what, one of the things that we, we saw with Kate was just that abandonment, right? So that puts her in the sphere that she has to defend herself. And so that's part of what we're working on. 
And so in that situation, would she then feel backed into a corner? Yes. And what do wolves do when they're backed into a corner? I, th I think we're going down the line that we believe she's a wolf now, right? I mean, mo most humans would defend ourselves, but I don't think she's gonna be the predatory alpha that's gonna lash out and attack. I don't see that okay. in my office. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect. Yes, Your Honor. So when I spoke about the incident of October 1st and you were just tying my trauma to abandonment, um, how do you think it impacted me to have my children restrained from seeing me by the respondent? Objection calls for speculation. Overruled. You can answer the question, Joe. Okay. Um, for you, right, that was that was another form of abandonment and betrayal, right? You were being betrayed by a partner that you had loved, and you were being abandoned because you didn't have access to your kids. And so we were dealing with right, a triggered response, which resulted, right, in anxiety, right, that elevated mood that we were then working on grounding and coping with. Did I speak with you about collusion that was occurring between the respondent and my wife, Sarah, with respect to sharing information with each other about my state of well-being? You have spoken that there, that you believe that there was conclusion. I can never say that word. That there was interaction between the two of them. And how did that contribute to my mental state in the last quarter of last year? It made you more suspicious. Uh, it made it harder for you to trust either one of them. Um, which then resulted in more anxiety. When, um, sorry, Your Honor. When I spoke with you about the incident with Sarah, who, who did I say started the physical portion of that disagreement? Uh, when we spoke about that disagreement, it was her. Do you remember what I said you did? Uh, she came after you, and that's when you guys fell to the ground. Have I described Sarah as being larger than me? She is. Have I described that Sarah was intoxicated that night? You have. Okay, have we discussed? Again, I'm sorry. Again, Mr. Roberto, I, I'm not telling you not to go down this way. I'm just telling you I excluded certain evidence about this incident uh, because you indicated that that's what you wanted. If you're bringing the incident up, then uh, you're opening the door to allowing people to bring in information that might contradict what you say about the incident. So you can't have it both ways. You can't put together your scenario of what happened, have other people say that for you, and then expect to block everything else. So it's up to you. I hear, I hear you, Your Honor. Joe, have we discussed that when I was a child, my mother was also a big woman and drank a lot? Yes, that was part of the, part of the trauma wound. No further questions. Recall. Joe, when you talk about her reaction, this betrayal, this this trigger to her PTSD, um, which caused more suspicion, would you say that that suspicion rose to the level of paranoia? No, because that would be more into a delusional or kind of psychotic piece. Well, isn't it true that she believes that people are trying to kill her? Um, that is part of her fear, but I would not, I don't see it as in a, into like a psychotic episode, delusional behavior, no. But you do acknowledge that she's discussed with you that she's afraid that people are trying to hunt her down and kill her. She is afraid that, yeah, people will attack and hurt her, yeah. And are those fears based on anything in reality? Just on her past experiences. So it's based on her perception solely. Correct, which is, which is characteristic of a, someone that it's impacted by PTSD. Right. So it was her self-reporting to you about the incident that Sarah was the aggressor. Correct and you have no other independent knowledge um, that would contradict that story. Correct. 
And in fact, pretty much everything that you have testified to today is based on her self-reporting to you. Have you done any, so I, I, let me scratch that. Have you done any independent investigative work to verify any of the information she's provided to you during the sessions? That would not be part of my scope of work. Okay. Would not be part of standard practice for a therapist. Okay, so everything that you've reported and discussed here today is based on her self-reporting to you. Correct. And no independent input. Um, have you conducted any tests with her? Uh, I constantly monitor for symptoms related to PTSD, anxiety, and depression. No further questions. Do you have additional questions? Yes, Joe, with respect to the fear of someone hurting me, who is the person in my childhood that I have named as the primary aggressor that created that fear? Your brother, Gabriel. No further questions. Do you have additional questions? No, Your Honor. All right, uh, you're free to go. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Don't discuss your testimony with other potential witnesses. Thank you. Are you going to resume the stand at this time, or do you have someone else? No, Your Honor, I'm done with witnesses besides myself. I would like to finish my testimony, please. Right, you're not going to call Michelle Lopez, then? Uh, Michelle Lopez became unavailable. All right, go ahead with your testimony, then. You're still under oath. Thank you. Um, in referring to the parenting plan that we have in place, right now, the temporary plan, it was ordered by the court for us to go to mediation prior to court action. I have asked the respondent over the last two years of us having that parenting plan in place for mediation multiple times. The first time was actually before the parenting plan. It was in the beginning of our discussions about the divorce. I had been trying to help pay her some money uh, to assist with her expenses, but I became unable to do so continuing. There was no formal court order child support or spousal support at that time. I first asked for mediation regarding the kids and the divorce on February 3rd, 2018. And, and even suggested the she said she's, she's discussing inadmissible settlement negotiations. All right. Well, it's my understanding that she is indicating that she's offered to mediate dispute and that, at least with regard to the parenting plan, that that was called for, and that's indicating your client's response. So I overrule the objection. You can't get into what it was you wanted to mediate, uh, but you can certainly talk about whether you wanted to mediate with general categories and what the other person's response was. Go ahead. Yes, Your Honor. I first asked for mediation on February 3rd, 2018, and even suggested a company we could use that my coworker had referred me to. If you look at Exhibit 20, page 29, that email will show that she responded to me, that I made that request. And then later in the email exchange, which is Exhibit 20, page 28, she stated that she would not mediate unless I continued to pay her. That was the first moment I began to feel that the petitioner's entire outlook on our custody case was going to become about money and not the children. Her spousal support runs out in a few months. She's already received other funds that were agreed upon in the divorce, but most of that will end at the end of this year. I, going back to mediation, on Exhibit 20, page 49, I asked for mediation yet again on March 5th, 2018. She declined. Once our parenting plan was put in place, which ordered, again, mediation before the court for disagreements, I continued to request mediation over issues around interpretation of the holiday schedule, as well as how to handle sports for the boys. Sports should become now keep getting into the details. Overruled. Sports had become an issue as I signed Orion up for T-ball and the respondent refused to take into practices on her time. 
If you look at exhibit 20, page 84 and 85, there is an email. It's relatively long to summarize. She argued that mediation was not worthy of the issues I was bringing up specific to the holiday schedule interpretation and sports. My reading of the parenting plan at that point was that any disagreement that we could not conclude on our own was eligible for mediation. So given her denial to mediate, I sent her a letter in person in the mail, once again, requesting mediation on February 19th, 2019. That letter is on exhibit 43, page one. She did not reply. Most recently, I reached out to the respondent's attorney as we prepared for this trial. I asked the respondent's attorney to enter into negotiations. She stated that her client wanted to reduce my time to every other weekend with Wednesday overnight. She stated that her client was unwavering on that, and I declined and took that as an inability for us to negotiate. I spoke okay, with well, a few I'm attorneys sorry, after that. I'm sorry, for the record, this is, uh, to this part, your objection originally was sustained. The, the Thank difference you, Your Honor. between mediation and negotiation, mediating a part of a parenting plan is mediation. Talking about negotiations generally isn't something I've considered. Go ahead. Okay. I did directly message Kate after speaking with her attorney to suggest using a parenting coordinator for us, even before the trial and ongoing after the trial. If you're familiar with the role of a parenting coordinator, they're obligated to follow the parenting plan and to act in the best interest of the children, but be a point of contact for both parties. The respondent declined. The respondent noted that she was concerned about having a parenting coordinator in place because of potential for additional conflict, which is contrary to the purpose of a parenting coordinator. I have felt completely exasperated by trying to work with the petitioner with respect to mediation and the parenting coordinator, and that is why I am seeking sole decision-making and custody. I will say that I do believe the children should be with both their parents, and I don't dispute that. But again, I believe that if we have no sole custodian and that that custodian should be me because of history of decision-making, we're going to continue to find ourselves in court. And I'll rest my case at that point. Okay, before I turn it over to cross-examination, what school district do you reside in? Gaza Elementary School, and the Commissioner Scheinberg had already ordered that the children attend my district. I'm just asking a question. You're in the Washougal School District? Yes, sir. Okay. And is that where the children are going to school at this time? That is where Orion is going to school. Archer is going to a private Camas Montessori school. I see. So Archer is in Camas Montessori school. And how, what grade is he in, going to be in? He is still preschool age. He will not be eligible for kindergarten for another year and a half. I see. Preschool. And what grade is Orion in? Orion will be going into second grade. And so you plan to keep them in the same school? Is that your, your plan? Yes, sir. Do you know how far apart you and uh, the respondent live? Yes, sir. It's four miles. And are you both in the same school district, basically? No, sir. She, because of the way the lines are drawn, she's in Camas school district. Okay, thank you very much. Cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Russo, when you talk about trying to mediate and getting into mediators and, co and parenting coordinators, exactly how did you word those requests to Kate? Well, I don't remember every single request, but I know that I said things like, mediation, please. 
So you said things like mediation, please, and expect a full response to that. That was one instance where I had repeated it after already asking, could we please have a mediator? Could we go to mediation? How so, can we discuss what mediator we can have? Once she, once she finally, once she kept refusing, why did you keep asking? Because it was my duty to follow the parenting plan and continue to do so. But there was nothing in the parenting plan about mediation or co-parenting or a parenting coordinator. So how that is, is that, that following? Is not I'm sorry, you have to wait till I finish. How is that following the parenting plan? That is not accurate. There is a uh, notation in the parenting temporary parenting plan saying that both parties will go to mediation before going to court. And have you ever been to mediation before? I'm unclear with whom you're asking. Have you been to mediation in a custody case before? No. So you have no idea whether or not it would be successful? No. And did you ever consider that maybe she just didn't waste any, want to waste her time? Because she felt it wouldn't be successful? No. So you never considered that? Nope. Okay. Talk to me about what it means to be a wolf. It's my spirit animal. And what does it mean? The wolf, it, the wolf as a social creature, a mammal, is a guiding animal for me to remember what's important to me, which is family. Tigers, for example, lions are all solitary creatures. The, the wolf is a family unit that I believe very strongly is important. But you've actually stated online and in other things that you are a wolf. You actually believe yourself to be a wolf. Isn't that true? No, that would be insane. Okay. So you don't, you, you've never referred to yourself as a wolf? Not in the way that you're implying. What happens to a wolf when they get backed into a corner? Depends on whether their pack is with them or not. Okay. What happens if the pack is not with them? They might growl. What else? They might bristle their feathers, to sh not their feathers, their fur to show that they're feeling threatened. And then what would they do if they continued to feel threatened? They would have to make a choice based on their amygdala to fight, flight, and freeze. And when you're backed into a corner, what do you typically do? It depends on the situation. Is it fair to say that you come out swinging? Not physically. Absolutely no. So is it your testimony that you've never struck another human being? Absolutely not. I didn't say that. Okay. So let's ask that question. Have you ever struck a human being? When I was a kid. So as an adult, have you ever struck a human being? There was an incident of me doing it in self-defense. Two incidents of self-defense. So you've typically never... I avoid, typically I avoid physical con conflict because I don't like it. In fact, I was a boxer at one point. I had one fight as a boxer and I quit fighting because I don't like it. Your Honor, can you please ask counsel to be more professional and not laugh at my testimony? I'm sorry, I'm trying to compose myself. Yes, I think everybody should control themselves and also should try to focus on things that might actually help me decide what I'm going to do here today. Have you but told the children that they're- As long as people are asking marginally relevant questions, even if they're asking it in a disrespectful manner and not helping themselves, they can go ahead and ask. Yes, Your Honor. Have you ever told the children that, they're, that they are wolves? I have told the children that human beings often have spirit animals, and Orion has aligned himself with being a wolf. What has Orion aligned himself with? I just answered that question. Did you just say Archer? Oh, she said Orion. Sorry, my, my, I misheard you. And what has Archer um, identified as? 
He's too young to know. Is he? Okay. So we're going to get back to the domestic violence. So it's your testimony that you have never struck, as an adult, you have never struck another human being except in self-defense. Affirmative. So when Sarah reported to the police that she was slapped in the back of the head and face three times by you, was that a lie? Counsel, it's not that was not a lie. Counsel, it's not appropriate under our state law to ask if a witness, uh, one witness, if another witness is lying. It's also inappropriate to ask about whether people who aren't witnesses are lying. So either way, the question is improper. The court would okay. have to decide the credibility of any witness that you chose to call or had the ability right. to call. Is it your allegation or your position that the police report is false? Yes. What part specifically of the police report is false? Are you submitting the police report as evidence? Yes, it is labeled as Exhibit 101, and I'm supposed Your to... Your Honor, I, I requested for that exhibit to be um, not admitted. Exhibit 100 hasn't been admitted. I haven't presented it for admission yet. So why are we speaking about an exhibit that's not admitted? I'm confused. That's a sincere question. You're now a witness, so I'm actually asking you the questions. You're under examination. Okay, now I've given the two of you an opportunity to chit-chat with each other. Now we'll get back to the normal procedure, which is I haven't seen a foundation for Exhibit 100, and so I deny its admission if you're offering it, and it's improper to ask the witness whether they believe in a document that's not before me is false or true. Okay, Your Honor, this... Your, to clear this up, though, Your Honor, we do need to address this. This was submitted through under ER 904 in advance of the trial, and it was timely submitted. Her objection when, when to the ER 904... When was it submitted? My ER 904 was submitted to the court... July 21st. No, it was before that. That's her objection. Sorry. Mm -hmm. July 14th. It was filed with the court. Okay. And did you receive an objection? I did. And her objection was based on timeliness. Okay. Well, 904 is fairly clear. If an objection is made to a document submitted under 904, then you can seek to lay a foundation for it here. If you're successful, you can seek to have the cost of having to do that paid by the court. But it doesn't make people automatically admit them. You still have to lay the foundation. So if okay, you lay right. the foundation, then it might be admissible, but it isn't otherwise. Did you ever strike Sarah? Yes. How many times have you struck Sarah physically? Twice. Did you ever strike Kate physically? Outside of a consensual BDSM relationship? Absolutely not. So what is it, what, can, you, t can you please explain what BDSM? Yes. Kate, I entered into a BDSM relationship with another individual, and Kate wanted the same. She asked me to hit her. Define BDSM, please. I don't remember what the abbreviation stands for, but it's about people who are interested in experiencing pain, which is what Kate asked for. So it's your testimony that Kate asked you to hit her. That is correct. And you were married once before to Jennifer, correct? 
That's correct. So you've had three spouses, yes? That's correct. And did you ever strike Jennifer? No. Did you ever push Kate? Not to my recollection. Did you ever push or shove Sarah? When she was getting physical with me, yes. Have you ever yelled at your children? What mother hasn't, of course. Have you ever yelled using the F word or any other curse word at your children? That time, yes, I did. So there's been no, uh, wait, what time are you referring to? The time that you keep pointing to. And when is that? Last year when my brother was staying with me. So it's only been once that you've used a curse word towards your children. That's your testimony? You didn't ask about using curse words towards my children. You asked if I've yelled curse words at my children. There's a difference. Okay. Is it your testimony that you have only yelled using curse words once at your children? To my recollection. But you've done other things using curse words around your children, yes? My children know, yes, and my children know what the deal is with respect to when they're allowed to swear. And so you think it's acceptable for a seven and a four-year-old to swear? No, I do not. They know that when they're allowed to swear is when they have a job or bills and are adults. What kind of books do you read to the kids at night? Books about tractors. Dump trucks. Orion wants to start working through oh, a science fiction book, but it's not appropriate for his age. So I was going to get him started on a Roald Dahl book because I have the full Roald Dahl set. How often do you reach the kids at night? It used to be daily. Over the course of the last six months since October, it's been maybe once or twice a week. Isn't it actually true that when you and Kate were together, she did all the reading with the children at bedtime? That's not true because I know Orion's favorite book by heart since I read it to him so many times. Talk to me about your past lives. What research have you done with regard to reincarnation and believing in past lives? What is the relevancy of that question? You opened the... Uh, I'm sorry, I, to, to the extent you're making any objection, since you brought it up in your therapist testimony, uh, or it got brought up there, I'm going to overrule it. It has very, 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 very little relevance. But okay, you thank you, Ron. Go ahead. Can you please repeat the question? What research have you done into reincarnation and past lives? I've probably read 30 to 50 books about all religions that I could get my hands on, including those that believe in past lives. And do you believe in past lives? That is, yes. And, how, and who do you believe you were in a past life? A variety of different humans. I do believe I've been animals before. Were you ever Jesus Christ? No. Were you ever Buddha? Nope. Is one of your children now Jesus Christ? Nope. Were you officially diagnosed as autistic? Yes. When was that diagnosis? Around May 2000. 17. And who, made that, and who made that diagnosis? A psychologist who specializes in autism by the name of Michael Brook. And how did he come to that diagnosis? Through discussions with me uh, as I was trying to get help to support Kate's diagnosis. Isn't it true that this psychologist, Michael Brook, is unlicensed? That he's a psychologist. I don't know what you mean by unlicensed. I'm not an expert in people's titles. Isn't it true that he is 
not licensed for to cut to treat or diagnose autism i don't know the answer to that question what classes or efforts have you taken besides therapy um to deal with your anger management issues i took an aggression course i believe in i don't remember when it was but it was cold so it must have been this past winter winter 2020 or 2019 they overlap so i'm not sure but it was between late 2019 and early 2020 that's so within the last 7 months that you that you took an anger management course is that your testimony it was um not called an anger management course but it was an aggression control workshop and do you have a certificate from that i do is that in your exhibits it is not i can produce it for you if you gave me some time It's in the kitchen. No further questions, Your Honor. I'm sorry, did you say no further questions? Yes, I did. Okay, Mr. Berto, is there something else you wanted to uh, say by way of testimony before you close your case? Um, no, I would just say that, you know, a person's spirituality, my spirituality is very personal and intimate, and I believe in my children exploring all spiritualities. So I've educated them on mine, but I've also encouraged them to learn about others as well and be respectful of others. They're kids, they're going to find their way someday, and I would like to say that with respect to yelling to a child, go the fuck to sleep, which has been referenced multiple times so far, there is in fact a book that has been published called Go the Fuck to Sleep because I am not the only parent that has been in a situation where I've been extremely frustrated by a child getting out of bed multiple times. for different reasons when they've already had their needs met. Okay, well, are you done with your testimony then? Yes, Your Honor. Then your first witness at counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. I'm going to call Kate Traverso. Is here present with me, Your Honor? Raise your right hand. You swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you? Yes. State your name, please, and spell your last name for the court record. Caitlin Elizabeth Traverso, <coughs> T R A V E R S O. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm going to ask you a few questions first, um, just very cursorily. Do you deny that your son is autistic? No. Are you support do you are you in contact with his doctors and working with his doctors and therapists with regard to his autism? Absolutely. Are you involved with the school and are you in contact with teachers with regard to his autism and needs for school? Yes, and occupational therapists, etc. Yes. Who is designated as the primary parent in the current orders? I uh, in the parenting plan I'm trying to remember the language it says under Washington state law um both parents shall be considered uh the primary custodians specifically we are not naming one if i can remember the wording correctly okay and was that intentional uh by the judge oh sorry was it whose intention was that by agreement or was that an order of the court uh it was it was by it was an order of the court the agreement i think that was our official agreement honestly i ran out of money so okay i could go any further it's okay what time does orion start school in the morning uh 8:55 and when you have the boys in your custody who takes them to school i take them to school and who picks them up i do when the children are in petitioner's custody who takes them to school i'm not really sure i think it changes um a lot of times it's sarah 
Uh, it's been Connie uh, Bible. Yeah, Connie Bible, um, they, they're a former nanny. And then uh, Tacey must do it. Uh, Justin, Your Honor, how would she know? Okay, well, lay your foundation uh, for how she knows then. I'll rule on the objection once I hear it. How do you know who takes the kids to school when they're in uh, Tacey's care? I, a lot of it just comes from the teachers, just offhanded. You know, Miss Tammy, the yard duty, uh, we talk every morning. Uh, Sometimes it's like, oh, when Orion was here, uh, your you know, honor, objection, hearsay. But okay, I'm trying, yeah, I'm no, trying I just, to find out whether it's hearsay or not. That's why I'm trying to take the oh. answer. So I got your, your objecting. I'm trying to let her finish the answer and then I'll rule on the objection. Thank you. Finish the so answer. Through, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, through just having my normal conversations with the, the teachers, the faculty, the yard duties in the morning, it just, you know, comes up, oh, you're here today. Yesterday it was so-and-so. I sustain the okay. objection. So when you and the petitioner were together, you provided, who provided the day-to-day -day needs for the kids? I did, definitely. What was your typically typical schedule during that time? I uh, I generally try to work nights so that a lot of the time that I'm at work, the kids are asleep. Uh, so I get up with them, you know, six a.m. and uh, they either go to school or don't, and I take care of them in the afternoon. Um, yeah, I generally start work. Uh, Throughout the, the entirety of the children's lives, I would start work in the afternoon, save for last year when I tried to switch to days. But you were, during the relationship, you were the primary care provider? Yes. Your Honor, can we get a definition? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Disregard. Please don't do that. And, ha and has that continued? Are you still their primary care provider during the day? As far as the, what my perception of the percentages of each adult's care time, yes, absolutely, yes. And I've been there to pick up the slack when, uh, when, when Tacey has, you know, ha had enough, ha has, when Sarah left again, or the, the multiple times that she's left, or when something else has happened where um, you've needed extra care. To the best of your knowledge, how many times have Sarah and Tacey broken up? Three, at least, maybe four. Is it your testimony? It was three, at, le at least three, but possibly four times they've broken up. Um, objection, Your Honor. How would she know? The I'll overrule the objection if she's tying it to times when you came over and asked to have uh, help because she was gone because then it's based on your statements, which are admissible. If that's what it is, if it's somebody else telling you, then it's a hearsay. So only limit your answer to stuff that you know. Go ahead. So there were uh, a few weeks in uh, last July, and then there were a few, uh, there were a few weeks uh, between October and some in early 2020 before Sarah came back and um, yeah, the, those, those would be the times that I've picked up. And to your knowledge, um, are they currently broken up? To my knowledge, yes. Okay. When you and Tacey were together, were you aware that she suffered from chronic PTSD? No. She never discussed that with you? I knew that she had PTSD. I didn't, mm, I didn't take it very seriously though. And why was that? I saw her actions as largely controllable. Okay. And, Let's talk about the relationship that you guys had. Did she ever strike you? Yes. When did she strike you? First time she was pregnant with Orion. This was so eight years ago. She had gone out with her family that day. I was not there for some reason. She got a sunburn. I was helping her. And 
I accidentally brushed up against her sunburn and she clobbered me fist and forearm. I can still feel it across my body this way. And I told her, do it again and I'm gone. And she said, if you leave, you're leaving this child too. That's it. You're walking out. And at that moment, I realized that I was not going to let her raise that child on her own. And that's, that's sick. I know that's, that's like, this is before I knew about domestic violence the way I do now, but I could not let that child be raised by someone who did stuff like that. Was that the only time she ever struck you? That was the most clear time, but it's not the only time. Did you ever ask her to hit you? Inside the bedroom kind of scenario, yes. Like, uh, you know, sorry, you, you know, like spanking types of things. Yes. But did you ever ask her to actually strike you? No. A strike would be an, sorry, a strike would be like an upward, like actual hit. No. Did she ever push you outside the bedroom? There were, not clearly, there were a couple of those times where I got pushed out of the way, but that, I consider that to just be rudeness. And was she ever demeaning to you? Absolutely. In what way? Uh, told me I was the world's doormat, told me during, I would have frequent panic attacks when she got home because uh, I was completely isolated when we moved up to Washington. I had no friends. Uh, I would have panic attacks about her coming home. And when I would try and compose myself in the next room for um, my own safety and security, she would either yell things from the door from the other door or as soon as I would come out she would say see you can't even take care of your own children right now you're just the world's doormat you can't even get a job right now mind you it was I think I got a job in maybe a month and a half I think it was it was really quickly but it, it was a really bad time did she ever humi humiliate you always in what way uh Posting things on Facebook, uh, my wife is hereby shamed by my hand, uh, my, my soon-to-be ex-wife is taking my house, let it be known. Uh, I don't remember the rest, but it was just some really strange language around that. There's also, um, she would say really embarrassing things that were just off you don't say to anyone just in front of her family um that she'd never say to anyone else oh don't let kate eat that it i can't even say it. it's profane okay. when when she has asked you about mediation why have you refused I have gotten, well, my gut tells me it's a very bad idea, but um, I have gotten the advice of my domestic violence advocates as well as my attorney um, that it was not, depending on the case, that it either didn't apply because it was something so frivolous that it took two messages for her to say, nothing but mediation, mediation, please. That became a common response, mediation, please. Uh, it just became another tactic to gaslight me. And in my opinion, and I know from experience now going to these DV classes, domestic violence classes, uh, that that is one of the worst things you can do is get into a room with your abuser and have them gaslight and manipulate an entire room full of people, including you, because it, it, it was going, I knew it was going to wear me out that I would just say, okay, 
because that's how this always goes. This is how it's always gone. I'm sorry, I just took a long time to answer that. Can you define for the court what is gaslighting in your mind? Uh, to me, gaslighting is when something is very clearly provoked in someone and the other person, where a victim is clearly provoked and the oppressor or the abuser says, oh no, that didn't happen, or oh, you're misremembering. That never, it never happened like that. Even when the documents state otherwise. Is that something that was common in your relationship? Always, yes. Have you seen um, her conduct herself like that with the children? No. Have you seen her conduct herself like that with Sarah? From some of the things I have seen, yes. This is when Sarah and I were going through a period of supporting each other. And how long have you been going to this DV group? Since March of last year. And who else goes to this DV group? I've seen Sarah there a few times. And this is a support group? Yes, it is uh, the YWCA's Safe Choice Domestic Violence Program. I have over 80 hours in it right now. And do you feel that it's helped you? Tremendously. And when you talk about manipulation, what kind of manipulation would petitioner engage in? I think one of the most common tactics was to wear me out, especially uh, exposing her entire inner monologue, well, false inner monologue, uh, via text or email. Uh, back and forth, back and forth, these negotiations that she would have almost with herself without any regard to my own um, input, where she would thereby say, oh, that's the conversation. Okay, here's my, here's my answer. It was always, here's, here's my answer, not, um, not what do you think? And when it, is what, when it was what do you think, in the instance of, for example, Lisa Yenny, this parenting coordinator. First of all, that's not what a parenting coordinator does. I know that from my domestic violence groups. It's, it was, it was, it was always phrased, and there were several emails phrasing it as this person comes out and suggested. And when I did give my thoughts, I should have known that was a trap. I cannot ever give my thoughts because my thoughts will be used against me. I, what I mean is my words, my written words will be used against me. And Objection. Your Honor, what does this line of questioning have to do with establishing the parenting plan? Your objection is overruled. It's on it has some relevance. Relates to whether or not I should order mediation as opposed to some other dispute resolution process. Yes, Your Honor. There, my, my point is that there was never, these, these things were never resolved. And in the case, uh, just to give you an example that's in the exhibits already, uh, the emails about Lisa Yenny, that was never going to get solved because she doesn't, that, she doesn't do that. She doesn't take the place of a lawyer. I, that is my example of gaslighting and manipulation. Okay. And is it your position that Petitioner is a controlling person. Absolutely. And what is that? How do you, what do you base that on? There is no choice. I can go down a list of so many of these documents that we have submitted, and one common theme, especially in the text messages and emails, is that there never is actually a choice. I get badgered and worn down until I either say, oh, okay, or until she finds a way to make it so that I'm being competitive. Is it fair to say that it's her way or the highway? Yes. You actually live in the Camas School District, right? Yes. And how does the Camas School District compare to the Washougal School District? I 
think there's maybe a 20% difference in school scores, something like that. Um, and I know which, which district has the higher scores? Oh, Camus. So you're seeking to have petitioner's time reduced from 50-50 to a local rule of every other weekend, correct? That's correct. And what are you basing that request on? I'm basing this on, namely, the last year where the kids and I have had to be very, very careful not to upset Tacey. I have been told that if I, if I come out with telling her I know some of these things, uh, that it can put her in a psychotic break. Um, Objection, Your Honor. She is not able to uh, diagnose a psychotic break. Okay, well, I, I this didn't is quite understand the, the answer, so. Are, are you indicating that this is something the petitioner told her or somebody else told her or something she's just assuming on her own? So could you clarify? Oh, to clarify, this is something my therapist told me, who's a domestic violence specialist. In that case, then, I sustain the objection. I'll disregard the answer. We can't. Oh, sustained. All right. Over the past, so you want her time reduced? Yes. Right? And what concerns do you have that would warrant such a reduction? I worry that reality is escaping Tacey. This is not the person I thought I married. And I say this with zero emotional attachment. I I just, I do not recognize her anymore. I And I fear what will happen if she continues to have the kids for such long periods of time. For uh, like what happened on Christmas, or Christmas Eve, I had to release the kids even, even after there was an ambulance and police sent to the house to make sure that she was okay. I had to release the kids and I was so scared that she was still going to go through with this ritual. I had to turn them over at eight. The ritual was supposed to be at nine PM. I can't have another thing like this happen. The kids cannot have this happen. They need their mother to be healthy. And when you were together, did she ever, did she have this wolf idea then? N no. Um, I mean, at that point, it was more about favorite animals. Um, I had like a feather necklace. I think she had a bear necklace. And we we would say, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely like an eagle. I'm definitely like a bear. And it no. So, so this this is very uh, foreign to me. Then I, I don't I don't really recognize it as a typical behavior um, from when we were married. So you heard Tacey's testimony about all the paperwork she filled out and all the research she did and the doctors and the schools and all that, right? Yes. Was her testimony accurate? I would say the paperwork that she filled out, that part was accurate. Oftentimes it was because the papers were already filled out and I would get notified after the fact. This often happened with school papers. Uh, with the medical records, uh, Kaiser puts us both at mom uh, as mom oftentimes. Uh, and for instance, that, that day after Christmas, Orion uh, thought that he, he just stopped walking. Uh, he had to have a nurse at Kaiser trick him into walking again because uh, he was just, uh, he just, he couldn't. Uh, he faked not being able to walk, and I'm listed as mom. 
even though I was the one who took him in and then told you this, told, told Tacey the story later. Um, so that, that part I cannot test, attest to being accurate. Uh, as far as scholastic things go, uh, Orion getting into Brick Zone, that was a school that I had called specifically. Uh, with Orion getting into Clark College, that was a school that I had been, that, that I was about to attend, he attended preschool of, uh, with Orion attending Camus Montessori. We actually both checked that school out um, when, when Tacey um, asked me about the difference between the, the co-op school and Camus Montessori, I said, oh, well, I was looking at Camus Montessori. I don't think we can use the co-op school because I already checked with them and I know their hours. Um, let's see, Goss was a decision of the courts. And then, yeah, I, I really keep in contact with all of the school faculty and attend lots of events like field day, uh, Archer's Valentine's Day at Brick Zone. Um, so you're yeah. very, are you very, how involved with the kids schooling are you? Very. Are you there all the time? Uh, when Orion's having a hard time, uh, I have definitely come in and that has seemed to help getting back on track initially with um, being able to get his worksheets done, especially since the teachers aren't allowed to you know, physically move him when he's trying to run for a door. I'm, I'm allowed to, you know, pick him up and say, no, back to the desk, for, for example. Okay. Yes. And I also go into the occupational, th the district occup occupational therapist room sometimes and uh, speak to her about uh, modifications I can make in my own home, things that I can buy, activities I can do, um, as well as the school psychologist, um, Dr. Clark, we chat frequently. I talk to him about parenting things. Good. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. Uh... So first of all, I'm about to ask you whether you have any questions. However, I want both of you to listen carefully, and I'm giving you this uh, little talk because I have enough experience with people representing themselves and doing examination of witnesses, especially witnesses uh, that are on the other side from them and especially the parties. In this court, as in uh, the real world, Questions and answers mean you are asking a question that you want the witness to answer. You're asking them something that they will provide the information. It is not an opportunity for you to testify. It is not an opportunity for you to argue with the witness. And if you don't get the answer you want, it's not an opportunity for you to say, that person's lying, here's what really happened. It is a question, it is an opportunity for you to ask questions and get information. And for the witness, it's an opportunity for you to listen to the question, answer the question, answer the not question. what you think they're getting at or what you think ought to be said, but listen to the question and answer it, and then wait for the next question. It's obvious that you two have some strong feelings about these proceedings and each other, and have, may have had rather spirited dis or discussions about that in the past. You are not here to have that today. You are here to ask questions if you have any and get answers if you know an answer. I hope I made that clear. Do you have any questions of the witness? Yes, Your Honor. Caitlin. In your testimony, you said that you did not deny Orion being autistic. Is that correct? I said that I did not. De yes, that, that is correct. I did not deny. Okay. Uh, I'd like to clarify, too. If you could please limit your answers to yes or no answers in the spirit of time, that'd be great. Didn't you delay an appointment regarding Orion getting diagnosed on October 14th and pushed it to December 20th in 2019? Yes. Did you ask my consent for that or just inform me after the fact? You can answer that without a yes or no. 
Objection, Your Honor. She's trying to instruct the witness how to answer questions. Well, she can say it, uh, whether or not I'm whether or not I would stop her from answering in a different way. She's apparently trying to lead the witness, and in this case, she didn't ask a leading question, so you're saying you don't have to give a yes or no answer. And I've already spent more time on explaining it to you than it would be just to go ahead and answer it. So I'm overruling the objection. Answer the question if you can. Uh, yes, I did seek your permission and consent. Did you send an email to Sarah in October stating there were no fla red flags that Orion is autistic? To me? I'm sorry. There no red no red flags to him. No red flags to you that Orion was autistic when you emailed Sarah in October. No. I have that in evidence, Your Honor. Is it acceptable to bring it up? If you want to show it to the witness, you can, yes. I know the email you're referring to. I just want to clarify that um, what I was referring to with red flags was there have been no red flags on any of the documented assessments. And I believe that's what I put in the email. I kept my personal okay, opinion said, out of it. You've answered the question, although there wasn't a question there. So will you, do you have a question you want to ask the witness? I've asked it. Let me continue, please. All right, I'm ready to continue. What things have you done? Actually, disregard that question. Have you honored the mom veto card that we discussed prior to the children's birth based on me being their biological parent? Nope. To your knowledge, has the court ever found either you or I guilty of domestic violence? I can't speak to your case. Did I inform you that the charge that was against me from October was dismissed by sending you the dismissal and informing you via email? You sent me the dismissal, yes. So doesn't that mean you were made aware that my charge was dismissed? Yes. To your knowledge, has the court ever, no, I'm sorry, disregard that question. With respect to the children, isn't it true that Archer's therapist and the two of us recently within the last month agree that he's doing well enough that he doesn't need to continue going to therapy? He's doing well enough that he does not need to do the video therapy, yes. Didn't you and I just have a call with Dr. Scott Brown who diagnosed Orion as autistic and we told, we both told Scott on that call that he seems to be doing a lot better? Yes. Didn't you share an email with Orion's kindergarten teacher containing your allegations of violence against me? Yes. Did you answer the question? Yes. Oh, I said yes. Do you think that's appropriate with respect to respecting both parents' relationships with the children's educators? Absolutely. That is protocol for when you're in a domestic violence situation. That is what every single domestic advocate has talked to me about, as well as some of my friends from the program. Yes, absolutely. Did you willingly violate the parenting plan on a few occasions because you had been told by other professionals that it was acceptable to do so? I don't know what you're referring to. Did you tell the children about my criminal history, which is not supposed to be spoken about based on our current parenting plan? He found out from a phone call. So initially I did not tell him, the jail did. He was on speakerphone. I thought it was the school calling. And before I could hang up because I was driving, he found out. I scrambled and called my domestic violence program, got in touch with an advocate, and she said, here's how you can explain it. We handle this all the time. Did you tell Ryan that I hit my spouse? 
I don't know. I did not. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Deb Reed, direct. No. Um, I would like to call my next witness, Your Honor, which is Gabriel Traverse. Take our afternoon break. It will be about 15 minutes. All right.